Right, good evening everyone on Zoom. Just John here, hoping you can all hear me. Hey, Ivan, if you can hear me. Thanks. Good. So the rest of you just kindly just mute yourselves and talk. We'll begin in about two minutes. I've just got a couple of parish notices to give out first. So bear with us. Be about two and a half minutes. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Half past seven on the dot. You see, I used to work for the railway, absolutely punctual. Um, welcome, everyone. We seem to have got a very good crowd tonight. This is excellent. We've got about half a dozen on Zoom as well. So if I seem distracted, I'm having two way conversation and keeping those on Zoom fully appraised of what's going on. A um, couple of parish notices first. Um, I managed to arrange a visit. You'll notice from the flyers knocking about is for a visit a week tomorrow, Thursday the 16th, to the Yacht Dig on Micklegates. For those who don't know York very well, it's near the old Kennings garage on the site that's about to be redeveloped. There's a dig going on live, and I've managed to book us in. They've said a maximum of 20. I've got four so far. So I only, well, I only put the information out yesterday, so there's a limited for 20. And then after that, it'll be about 45 minutes, I aim to go down towards Bale Hill to show us where we're going to propose doing a ground penetrating radar scan of the medieval ramparts. That is to come. But the thing that is live will be the dig. So actually going to see the dig in action. No stiletto heels, I'm told, because it's going to be muddy. It is a live dig. I must have missed the first one I've been to since I was a child. I'm quite excited. That's a week tomorrow, Thursday the 16th. There are the flyers about. Please let me know on the book of place, either by phoning me or emailing me on the email that's on the flyer. Um, secondly, some really excellent news. Some of you may recall the boundary stone for the York and North Midland Railway on Lowther Terrace. Now this has been going on for years. Um, Angela Wheatcroft first pointed out at the York Archaeological Forum in 2017. Work starts next week. Right, right, back to Nick. I mean, it's, Nick's been the prime mover on this. So Pinnacle Conservation are going to repair the wall, fix the guttering, and just protect the stone so it won't erode anymore. So it's for future generations. And we are going eventually to produce an information board to go by the stone to explain to people. Um, I've been doing a little work just to sort of... Of course, it was at a loss to realize why the York and North Midland would put the boundary stone on Lowther Terrace in 1839. In the newspaper of May 1839, there is a huge, huge column, a dispute between the landowner who wants to build Lowther Terrace and the York and North Midland Railway. And people wanted access to the new railway station so they wouldn't have to walk up Blossom Street and Thief Lane, Queen Street. Who was the landowner who was objecting to this? Hocklington School, school owned the land beyond where Lowther Terrace is now, towards Holgate Road. So there's a big dispute. The bill, in the end, 1839, was £4,000. So if Pockington School suddenly got an extension for their building in 1839, we now know what paid for it. So that is why that boundary stone is there. So it solved a little bit of the problem. You know, that's the very best of news I wanted to share with you. So, by the way, there's also a note that came in. There are two tables, one with that. <coughs> There is a special table, which is <coughs> here, and these are books that have been donated by an old member of Yaya's. No sensible offer refused. <coughs> I'm afraid the copy of Charles Brunton Knight's The City of York has gone. Yes, I've got that. So, yes, there's some good old titles there. There's RCHM Volume 1, I think I can see there. So by all means, have a browse at the end. So to tonight's talk. Andrew Woods has given a talk to us before on another coin hoard, the Rydale hoard. Um, if you want some follow-up on the Rydale hoard, it is in the reprinted copy of Roman York. It has the details of the hoard if you want to follow it up later on. So I recommend that. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce you to Dr. Andrew Woods. He will take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Woods. I'm the senior curator at the Yorkshire Museum, which means I uh, lead the team who care for and share the collections um, 
held there, archaeology, geology, biology, and numismatics. And um, uh, I'm here to talk to you today about what you can see on the screen behind me, uh, the Rydale Ford. Um, just you know, push the right buttons here. Um, ooh, very dramatic. Um, uh, so it's, it, um, sorry, can I, I'm just gonna fiddle with this for a moment so I can, otherwise I'm watching lots of people rather than looking at my slides. There we go. Um, no, it's okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about the Rydell Hoard today. It is an amazing discovery. Um, the Yorkshire Museum has been collecting uh, archeological objects found in York and the region for 200 years. And we have nothing like this in our collections. It's not a find of a lifetime. It is a find of a couple of centuries, I suppose. And really the aim for this evening is to, for me to explain why we think it's so special, why we think it's so exciting. Um, and to give you a little bit of an insight into what is quite an enigmatic story about why it might have been brought together and hidden in the ground. I will say it is a very recent find. It was only found in 2020. It was only acquired by the museum in 2021. So we're right at the beginning of the story. Um, I'm going to come almost with as many questions as I have answers today. Um, and we'll be flagging up kind of the future work. Where will we go in the future here, rather than telling you, the, I guess, the final word on it. And I'm also very much going to draw upon the work of others this evening. Um, uh, the Post Antiquity Scheme, uh, Amy Downs and Rebecca Griffiths, uh, John Pierce and Sally Worrell, and Adam Parker and Lucy Crichton at the Yorkshire Museum. It's been a, a collaborative effort to interpret um, this horde to this point. So then, what am I going to do this evening? I'll first of all start by talking about the story of discovery. Where was it found, by whom, when, and a little bit about that. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about its journey to the museum. Um, not an absolutely straightforward one, I would suggest. Um, and then I'll spend most of the time actually telling you what are these objects? Why are they important and why are they interesting? Um, talk a little bit about their context, and that's where actually we've haven't done quite as much work as I'd like just yet. And then if I've got time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the exhibition and how we interpret them for a museum audience. Um, I won't talk about that too much because I hope you will all come and see it in the museum, um, uh, but I won't push the plug too much this evening. So then, when I talk about the Rydell Hall, what actually is it? What you're looking at are four Roman bronze objects. Um, they're obviously not to scale here, um, they're slightly smaller than you see on the screen. Um, and they were found hidden together in a small hole in the ground near Ampleforth in North Yorkshire. Um, and the images here, um, looking left to right, on the left you have a bust of a Roman emperor, uh, which is very likely to be the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, and I'll explain why um, in a little while. We have a, a horse and rider figurine, um, the one, second in from the left there, um, the handle from a key in the shape of a horse, and lastly on the right, a plumb bob used for establishing a straight vertical line. And I will explain a little bit more about each in course. Um, and I'm going to talk about them individually as objects. And then as a group, I'll refer to them as a, as a horde and think about how they relate to one another and why they might have ended up in the ground. These four objects were found in uh, 2020 um, by two metal detectorists, uh, James and Mark. Um, and you can hear actually their story in, in the museum if you come. We've got a nice, really nice video of them talking about the excitement of the find. They found the little horse and rider figurine first, um, um, although an initial glance suggested it was a sort of Victorian toy, and so didn't necessarily think they had stumbled upon this really important group of Roman objects. Mm -hmm. It was only sort of sitting down and taking a proper look at it that they realized, oh, actually, we've got something very special here. And then they went back and um, looked a bit harder for the other objects. Um, the others um, you can see here were found thereafter. Um, horse and rider is probably at the top of the deposit. Um, uh, the bust you can see here on, on the left um, was I think upside down above that. And then the plumb bob here on the right was at the bottom of the hole. Um, as, as best as we know, um, there was no archeological recording at the time. Um, uh, to be honest, most of the museum staff were on furlough at that moment in 2020. So there wasn't an opportune moment for that sort of thing. Um, and I guess the other thing to point out here is the amazing condition of these objects. This, they're, they're muddy and dirty here, but they've uh, needed very little conservation since, um, since they've come uh, out of the ground, um, only, only minimal at this point. And I'll say thank you to James and Mark for their, um, I guess, openness in telling us their story and for sharing their images that I can show you this evening. They've been really helpful in that regard. Um, 
After it was uh, found, it was reported to what's known as the Portable Antiquities Scheme, which is a national scheme that records fines made by members of the public, and particularly to metal detectorists. And uh, there it was recorded by Rebecca Griffiths and Amy Downs onto their national database. And you can read about it um, on the database now if you want, fines.org.uk, and we'll, you'll find your way to it. Um, uh, if you've heard much about the Portable Antiquities Scheme in the past, um, uh, objects that are over 300 years old and made of gold or silver are declared treasure and become the property of the crown and there's a sort of a whole set of legal protections for them. Because these were bronze objects, they are not subject to that, they're not part of treasure, um, and there were no legal protections for them. And they fall into a sort of slight loophole in, in the treasure law, where things like, like the other objects you see on the screen here, uh, most famously the Crosby Garrett helmet, which was sold at private auction and hasn't ended up in public hands. And more recently, um, uh, this dog statue from Gloucestershire, um, both of which are un unparalleled in Britain and now in private hands rather than in public. Um, and that is what happened to the Rydell Hall as well. It didn't automatically come to us as a museum. It went out to, um, to auction before we were able to acquire it. There is some good news on that front. The DCMS are looking at reviewing the treasure law to try and close this loophole. And for really significant objects like the Rydell Hoard or the Crosby Garrett helmet, they're hoping that they will be offered some legal protection going forward. Um, but who knows? We have a new culture minister <laughs> this week, so we shall see. Um, uh, so after, after it had been found and reported to the Port Antiquities Scheme, it did then go to auction. Um, and it led to quite a lot of press at the time. So these are just a few of the um, headlines. Um, uh, it often. Yeah, it ended up quite associated with the film Gladiator in a lot of the popular press, for better or for worse, I suppose. And for, a, for something unique for a Yorkshire Museum object, it was also on Bargain Hunt. Um, so if you were watching Bargain Hunt in the latter part of 2020, you would have seen the hoard there at, at, at the same time. Um, that came as a bit of a surprise to me, if I'm honest. I didn't realise we were going to see it on there. Um, and we were ultimately unsuccessful at buying this object at auction. Um, but we were able to purchase it following the auction. Um, so we bought it from the person who was successful at the auction. And we are incredibly grateful for those who helped us um, with that. We don't have a, a major acquisitions budget in the museum. It was through um, donations and then trusts and foundations that we were able to get there. So uh, a major donor, Rick Bellison, helped us with that. But the Art Fund, whose logo you see on the screen here, the American Friends of the Art Fund, uh, Mark Story, David Aaron and a number of others um, made that acquisition possible for us in the museum. Um, and the objects arrived in uh, November of 2020 um, uh, in, in, in the museum. And I had seen them before that, but only for a matter of minutes, you know, here and there. Um, and never really had a chance to properly examine and uh, enjoy them, I suppose. And, that day of when they arrived in November of 2021, it's one of the most exciting I've ever had as a curator, incredibly uh, thrilling privilege to be able to get up close and personal with them. Um, and a few months later, we, when we put them on display, that was a real privilege as well, to be able to share them with the public for the very first time. Um, so happy ending. Yeah. Uh, there were points in 2021, I was less convinced there was going to be a happy ending. So if I told you a little bit about how they came to us, what's actually in this hoard? Well, there are four objects, the most spectacular of which is this. It is a small bronze bust depicting a Roman emperor. And it's made using what's known as the lost wax method, where um, wax is shaped around clay in the shape that you see here. More, wax, uh, more clay is added around that. And then uh, hot, hot metal is added, which melts the wax away. And you're left with the impression that you can see on the screen here. It's then been embellished with in, incised uh, lines. So you can see the hair, uh, the mustache and beard have sort of uh, incised lines to um, as decoration. And the eyes are hollow, but probably originally held settings and may well have been colored. Um, I think it's the most fantastic thing I've ever seen. But if you showed this to someone in Rome uh, in the second century when it was made, I think they would describe it as a provincial style. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's so it's very likely of British or Gaulish manufacturer, and we can see that in the large eyes, so much larger than life size, 
and they're sort of lentoid, they're almost pointed at either side. Um, and the ears are very stylized in their form as well. So rather than being kind of realistic ears, they're very sort of simple curves, um, as you see here in the image on the left. Um, we don't know precisely whereabouts in, in Britain or Gaul it was made, um, but um, uh, it's certainly within the province in all likelihood. Um, and this isn't just a depiction of anyone, but is very likely to be uh, Marcus Aurelius. Um, and these are two depictions of, of the emperor that you see um, uh, that are well, some of the more famous ones. So this is an image from the Capitoline Museum in Rome. And this is one of many similar statues across the empire. This is um, quite a, 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 um, a standard portrait of Marcus. And then probably even more common, and certainly would have been a more common image we see in, in York, is uh, the image of him on his coins. So why are we confident that our slightly stylized bust is this emperor? It's, it's in the hair and in the beard in particular. So if, on the image on the left, you can see what's called a, a bifurcated beard. So two prongs on the beard um, coming down here um, and then sort of a neat mustache and then curls around the top of the head here, which if I go back one, um, is exactly what you see. And it's particularly the beard that suggests to us that this is Marcus Aurelius. Um, Marcus Aurelius, uh, as uh, many of you will know, reigned as emperor between uh, 161 and 180 uh, on his death, um, so never came to Britain. So the artist who created this object um, would probably have been working from artistic sources like the ones we see here, you know, familiar with coins and statuary, but not, you know, sit, not sitting across the emperor making this. So if that's who, then actually what is it? Well, I've described it as a bust and it's about um, 13 centimeters in height. So a bit dark, sorry, but um, six or seven inches in, in height um, and then eight centimeters in width. Um, so it's not an enormous thing. Um, and it weighs about 400 grams or so. And it is a, a scepter head. Um, and you get a slightly better sense of the object when you see it uh, on the back and in the round, as you see on these images. So the, the back shows how it functioned in that, um, I hope you can see that on this image on the left, you've got three holes in here, which are probably rivet holes where it would have been attached to something probably wooden behind it. And then something would have run up inside the hollow head. And then there was a little plate of, uh, of bronze then added um, to kind of hold it in place on the back as well. Um, this plate is secured through two rivets on the neck, and you can just about make one out on that. Slightly easier to see in real life. Um, so it, imagine you're seeing part of an object, the metal part of an object, but with a, a wooden element to it missing now. The style of the portraiture, um, with this very stylized forked beard, um, is most consistent with portraits of uh, Marcus Aurelius that were created after his death in 180, around that time or immediately afterwards. And so we think the scepter head was probably of about that sort of date and um, created around 180 or in the years shortly thereafter. Um, that's the only dating evidence we have for the hoard. It gives us a, a terminus postquem, a date after which it must have been put in the ground of 180. Um, but I don't know whether that's five, 10, 20 years later. We're kind of broadly saying late second century is the likely uh, deposition date for this hoard. Um, and uh, what is it used for? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a scepter. So it's something to be designed to be uh, held and wielded. And the fact that it's to, uh, uh, showing an emperor strongly suggests to us that this is um, a scepter used by um, a priest of the imperial cult. Emperors had their own cults, um, often were deified upon their deaths. Um, and then had priests that went out and, and, and spread the word of that emperor as a god um, in the years that followed. And we think that is what this is, a tool of that trade, if you will. We do occasionally find the other elements of scepters in, in British context. Um, there is a whole scepter at uh, Wanborough, um, but there you do also find other bits of them. And these are, so this is um, scepter binding. So imagine bits of wood running up and down from here. And then a set the terminal. So imagine a bit of wood running down into the bottom of this here. And the image you see on the right of the screen here, um, if you can imagine sort of wood joining these bits up into a scepter that would be, you know, this sort of height, um, that's the sort of thing we're envisaging here. 
Um, we obviously don't have any of those other pieces or any of that surviving um, organic material. Um, um, so it is a scepter that has been, appears to have been decommissioned almost. Um, and this sort of gives a sense of it. And we think it is likely to have been uh, wielded by a priest of the imperial cult. Um, and we have actually reasonably good evidence for um, these people in York. Um, they're known as the Severi Augustales, um, a priest of the imperial cult, if you will. And um, we have a couple of bits of evidence for their presence in York. So um, the first of which is on the left of the screen here. This is an altar stone from Bordeaux. Um, erected in 237, where it is talks about um, Marcus Aurelius Lunaris, Seve Augustales, the colonies of York and Lincoln. So this is a priest of the imperial cult who has erected this stone uh, upon his arrival um, uh, in Gaul. Um, interestingly, he probably brought this bit of stone with him um, from York, which is a sort of an interesting uh, thing. And then there's a, a lost coffin, um, uh, lost some years, hundred, some hundreds of years ago. Um, but recorded in um, uh, written sources from the 18th century in particular, which uh, talks about uh, Marcus Bericundius uh, Diogenes, um, who's Sever of the colony of York. So these are priests uh, of the imperial cult. Um, and we have these sort of literary references um, to them um, in York and in other places besides. Um, but we don't really know what they did. How they how they functioned, what what how they might have gone about their work, I suppose, um, and we certainly don't often find the tools or the objects that they might have used for that work, which is why it's so exciting to have um, this scepter head. Um, I'd love to say that our scepter head was unique. It's rare, very unusual, but it is, and it's certainly the most northerly find of a scepter head from Britain. But we do know of a small number of parallels from elsewhere um, within Britain. Um, this is the closest parallel to it, um, um, although this one is much larger and heavier. Um, so it's uh, two or three centimeters uh, wider and taller, but then also much thicker. It's, it's about four times the weight. And it's from a place called Seen um, in Northamptonshire and is on display in the Ashmolean Museum if we ever get there. But there are a lot of similarities between this and our example from Rydale. Um, you can see sort of the, the curly hair across the top here, and um, those large lensoid eyes, the kind of quite neatly rendered mustache, and then particularly this incredibly stylized um, two-pointed beard. Um, uh, so this sort of stylistic arts, uh, arts um, yeah, stylistic similarities, but there are some differences. So the eyes here uh, in a bright blue glass, uh, survive in a way that they don't in the Rydale example, um, but might give a sense of what it looked like um, uh, at the time. Um, and there's a different form of construction. So the neck is quite solid, um, whereas the Rydale example is hollow at the back. Um, so it suggests that there is a little bit of difference here. Um, there are a number of other examples from Britain, um, five in total. Um, and I've got a couple of other images here. So. Um, on the left, you have an image that has been identified as Antoninus Pius, um, late second or early third century um, AD from Willingham Fen, which is si quite similar in size um, to uh, the Rydell example, if anything, a little bit smaller. And then actually the closest example of all is the one on the right here, which is almost identical in size to, to Rydell. And the form of construction is quite similar um, uh, from uh, uh, Dustin in Northamptonshire. Um, not pictured, but also um, there are also examples of Commodus, um, so uh, again, second century, and Crispina, his wife, in different scepter heads as well. Um, it's very likely that this is a much more common set of objects than survive to this day. Um, a, a, a depiction of a, um, of a Roman emperor beautifully rendered like this would be a very precious object, particularly if it's then wielded by a priest. So it's not likely to be the sort of thing casually discarded or lost and thus available for us to find as archaeologists. So we're quite lucky when we do turn them up, I suppose. How these might have been used. So if you can imagine them on that scepter, that wooden scepter, um, we see them now as sort of greeny, browny or black. Um, these are bronze. So imagine almost shining like golden in their appearance. It would have been quite an impressive object um, uh, in, in its kind of original form. And 
I, what I think is interesting by showing you these other examples is there isn't a kind of consistency to how they're made, the construction, how they're mounted, how they are sort of physically rendered and the style of them is quite variable. So um, I suggest we're not getting a sort of centralized bit of kit um, that is sort of given out to a, a set of priests, but it's something um, more local and uh, um, I guess more reflective of the local uh, situation. The other ones won't take quite as long, I promise, but uh, this is number two. So the second object is a horse and rider figuring. Um, it's about eight centimeters long, about three centimeters wide, um, and about nine centimeters in height. Um, and it's all cast in a single piece, and it is incredibly detailed. You get a real sense of both the horse's uh, bridles and bits, and also the clothes um, of the rider here. What we're missing from this is um, in the left hand, you've got almost, it's quite a stubby hand almost. Um, and that's probably because it would have originally held a shield, would have been on there. Um, and then in the, in the right hand raised up by the head here, there would have been a spear, um, but again, missing um, conceivably in a different material. There are little pegs at the feet of the horse, which you can just about see here and here on the left. Um, and it probably would have been mounted into a small plate um, of some form, um, either metal or wood, um, both, uh, both exist in other parallels. Um, it's likely that it was removed from that plate in antiquity, not that it was um, uh, lost in kind of in, in the unearthing or something like that, because it's, it's quite consistently patinated across the bottom here. Um, and what you're seeing here is a depiction of the god Mars, um, I'll explain a little bit more about that. You might be quite familiar with seeing Mars depicted um, in this sort of way. This is quite a classical depiction of Mars. Um, if you've ever been to the Yorkshire Museum, you'll have been greeted by our depiction of Mars here. Um, but you also uh, see it in, uh, uh, in ring settings and in uh, bronzes in, in lots of different ways um, on coins and the like. Um, Mars is often depicted in quite similar ways, um, helmeted um, with a shield in one hand and a spear in the other. Um, our statue of Mars would have had a spear here, but um, it got lost along the way somewhere. Um, and this is quite a typical way of seeing Mars. But in Britain, um, Mars gets depicted as a horse and rider, um, probably more regularly than that more classical depiction of him. And so this is... Um, uh, a really lovely example from Cambridgeshire, where um, you have this sort of very sort of stylized, um, almost Iron Age horse. Um, and then Mars would have been holding a spear in his right hand up here, and again is missing his left arm, which would have held a, a shield. Um, and there are about 25 examples of such figurines known from Britain. Um, and really helpfully, we can be confident that these are depictions of Mars, because there is a, a, a a fragment of one in, in from Martlesham, which is now in the British Museum, which has got the, the feet for the horse and on the bottom of the plate that is attached to it says Mars. Um, so it doesn't get much more um, indisputable than that. Um, uh, so it, yes, so if you're a bit skeptical, then we, it's written down somewhere so we can reasonably confident <laughs> about it. Um, I, I just put this up. So on the left, you have a distribution of metal figurines from Britain, all of the dots. And on the right, you have a distribution of Mars figurines from uh, Britain. And um, what is interesting about this and why I put this up is that we might expect to see more depictions of Mars in Northern Britain, an area which is very military and uh, we might associate with the god Mars, but actually we see far more depictions of Mars in Southern Britain. A um, number of reasons that might be behind that, but one of which is that I'll just kind of put in your minds today is that we think of Mars as the god of war, and he is absolutely the god of war and is often associated with, with soldiers and the like, but he also has a very important role within the agricultural cycles uh, in the Roman period, is about um, um, the virility of growing things as much as, as, as he is about um, soldiers and fighting, and uh, so that might explain why we have this distribution, and it might just add a little bit of nuance to why we think this figurine of Mars might have ended up within, um, within the horde. Um, get lots of depictions of Mars in other media as well. So these are horse and rider brooches, so to be worn um, uh, on, on clothing. Um, 
and uh, they're quite a standard form and again um sort of show show the depiction of mars as horse and rider is is the most kind of prevalent and most common um a depiction of this god um, in in roman britain right um so why might this have ended up in the horde well this was probably an item of personal devotion in its in, in its uh, use so it may have been part of a part of a, a portable shrine or um placed alongside an altar um it probably where that item uh whether the bust of marcus aurelius is about kind of public display this is perhaps more about um private um uh, relationship with the god mars um so slightly different thing um even if they're kind of broadly within that area of belief um the third object in the hoard is uh, this one which is of a key it's about five centimeters long and about two centimeters in width um and it is a horse as you can see it's cast um in quite good detail you get a kind of get a sense of leaping forward from it a real sense of movement and we know that it's a key because it's missing um uh, you can see the iron staining here and a stub of iron you get a better sense of it there and um you can imagine that um the kind of the shank of the key and then the um the teeth at this end would have been extending out there. What we don't know is whether it went into the ground as a whole key, and then the iron has corroded away in the 1800 years since then, or whether it was broken and it went in as a as a as a broken key with only the stub um, there. I don't think we're ever going to know. And um, kind of careful excavation at the time might have been able to tell us that, but I, I think that sort of evidence is now gone. I'm afraid. Um, and this is, comes from a class of objects, um, which you might refer to as sort of chunky animal keys. And there's lots more of them um, from Roman Britain. So you've got a bear here um, uh, in the top left. You can just about see its nose, little ear, and an eye there. Um, you've got a dog uh, in the bottom, a dog or a wolf, um, depending on how friendly you think he looks, um, here in the bottom left. Um, and then in the top right is a sort of advancing lion. You can see the kind of uh, a leg there a nose and mouth and then here, here. And this, this one is quite helpful to show you the sort of keys you might expect to find. Um, the iron doesn't often survive. We're only often left only with the, the copper, eye, copper, copper alloy elements. Keys are interesting. Um, they have magical properties in the Roman period. They're about unlocking or locking. And that's why it's quite interesting to know whether it went in the ground whole or broken. But they um, they can be used as a kind of connection between our world and the world of the gods um or if you're hiding a deposit away and you don't want anyone to open it up again break your key and add it there's there's some quite interesting possibilities for this key um in the interpretation and the last um but by no means least is the plumb bob and this is plumb bob it's about um uh eight centimeters in height and about four centimeters in width uh, or diameter i suppose um, it's perhaps not the most beautiful object in the hoard, um, but I think it is actually really important to helping us understand why this might have gone into the ground. Um, so uh, I have one of these in my garage. I'm sure some of you, not, not as quite a nice one as this, but uh, you know, plumb bob is, is quite a simple object. And they were used in the Roman period, either individually or as part of a, a piece of surveying equipment known as the groma. Um, gromers were used by um, engineers uh, to lay out um, roads, buildings, fields, almost anything, you name it, and um, uh, they were used for it. Um, how it works is if you have enough of these and they're, and they're sort of lined up, if you look at these um, and line up your two straight lines and you have someone off in the distance, then you can lay things out in a perfectly long line um, moving away from you. Um, and there were kind of official land surveyors and this would have been the tools of their trade basically um so yeah that that, that is a, a very brief introduction to the objects individually and what they might have been used for in their i guess working life and the big question that we pose in the exhibition and which if i didn't try and answer it i'm sure one of you would ask me is like who may have buried this hoard and and why and that's what I'd like to move on to. So move from thinking about them individually to a, sort of a totality and the relationship between them. And there's sort of two ways of thinking about this. The first is by looking at some comparisons. I've started by doing some of that already. 
And the second is to think about the context of the site um, itself. Um, so that big question, who buried the hoard? And I guess why? Um, the question that I'm often asked is, is this just a kind of cache of metal designed to be melted down, turned into something else in the future? And there is certainly good evidence for the recycling of metals in the Roman period. Um, precisely made alloys like these will be, have a value to them and could be turned into other things. Um, and the slightly random mix of objects within this hoard could suggest you're looking at some sort of metal workers cash. However, the really precious nature of some of these objects, the depiction of the god Mars and of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, strongly suggests to me that that is not the answer here. I don't think you would just be casually taking those, burying them and melting them down. I think there's, there's more to it than that. Um, much more likely, and what I'll talk spend most of my time talking about, is a kind of spiritual reason for their burial. Um, and the fact that there are kind of overtly spiritual objects within this, um, uh, an image of a deified emperor and of god Mars in particular, strongly suggests this. There is a lot of evidence uh, in the Roman period for what are often called place deposits, um, uh, objects brought together and put in a certain place, usually as an offering to the gods of some form. And these take a variety of different forms. There's almost, almost unimaginable variety in these, everything from um, food uh, and uh, an animal bone all the way up to beautiful um, pieces of uh, metal um, or precious metals. Um, we see lots of evidence of objects as offerings to the gods. We see cursed tablets written with messages to the gods thrown into, into watery mm -hmm. places. You see coins um, chucked into, um, uh, into the, the Roman baths in Bath, for example. Um, and wealth was often hidden in what we think of as quite a contractual way. I will make this sacrifice or I will bury these beautiful objects. And in return, Mars, you will do this thing for me or smite my enemies or make this woman fall in love with me. Those, all those sorts of things. Um, it's much more contractual than I guess we're used to thinking about. And we can see that other bronze hoards in the Roman period um, were, were, were hoarded, uh, buried with the idea that um, they have a sort of spiritual purpose. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. So this is the first one from Felmingham Hall in Norfolk. Um, here you have similar sorts of objects to what you get in Rydale. You've got this amazing head of Jupiter and then a slightly smaller bust of Minerva. Um, and then lots of other depictions of other sort of uh, deities, both Roman and um, Iron Age, Celtic, I suppose. Um, and these were carefully selected and placed within a vessel that you see here depicted in the bottom right. Can't read the rest of my notes, but um, uh, so, and we know that these were buried in vicinity to, uh, in close proximity to a, a known temple site as well. So these are objects that are very likely sort of spiritual um, offerings to a god and um, buried close to a place of worship of said god. Um, second example from Willingham Fen um, is even closer to our Rydell Ford example. Here we have uh, a scepter head of a Roman emperor, Antoninus Pius in this case, and a horse and rider figurine buried in close proximity to one another. Um, uh, within a uh, what appears to be a box, um, a wooden box of some form. These are uh, buried close to a known Roman shrine as well. So this is very much an offering to the gods um, uh, with these types of objects in it. And so I think we should be thinking about um, spiritual reasons for the deposition of this hoard um, uh, of, of the type that you see here. And I guess um, in both of those examples, neither of them include tools. And what's the, in some ways, the most unusual thing about the Rydale Hall is not that depiction of the emperor or of Mars, as beautiful as those objects are. It's the presence of those amazing objects with what is quite a mundane object in the plum bob. Um, I haven't been able to find a parallel for the deposition of a plum bob alongside these types of objects in Britain. Um, it may exist, we're still doing that bit of work, but it's certainly not common by any stretch of the imagination. And I think actually thinking about the plum bob is quite helpful to us as thinking for when we're thinking about reasons for it, um, for the, the hiding away of these objects. Um, 
it may be that it's a act of what we might call landscape management, the creation of a new house, new farm, a new road that required spiritual blessing that was behind the deposition, the deposition of this fort. Um, many everyday aspects of Roman life and work required religious sanction, the blessing of the gods, um, the building of things, uh, the establishment of new towns, roads, forts, all of them carried um, a sort of symbolic ritual significance to them, as well as being kind of practical, of, um, uh, practical things. And one clear example is uh, of that is what you see on the screen here, which is um, we know from writings at the time that when a new town was laid out, a spiritual boundary was drawn all the way around that town. That formed the edge of the town, and beyond that, that's that was the countryside around it. And the way in which that was uh, was formed was two animals were yoked together, a cow and a bull, as depicted here. So you've got a bull with his horns here and a cow here. And the uneven strength of those two animals meant that they gradually made a giant circle around the town. And how big the circle was, was interpreted as, as the will of the gods, essentially. And I show you this, not because this is why the Rydell Horde was buried, but just to show that there's an all, all manner of spiritual and um, I guess spiritual project management for a better but want a better word that went on in the Roman period that leaves very little archaeological traces you know we just don't find evidence of this um anywhere in particular you wouldn't think if there was a circular boundary around town that it was because two animals been yoked together and the blessing of the gods had been sought but that is what what happened um and I wonder whether the burial of the Rydell horde may have fulfilled a similar ritual purpose um, and the inclusion of the plum bob would suggest it may have been a kind of building um, or landscape um, that was being sought, uh, blessing was being sought for. That could be the road, it could be a building, it could be a field system, we don't know that. The, the presence of the bust would certainly suggest um, it's got a kind of official blessing. Someone was seeking the blessing of the Roman administration, the emperor, um, and including that depiction of the emperor within it. In, in seeking that, um, seeking his blessing. Um, the presence of Mars could be a connection to the army, but Mars also has quite a lot of agricultural connections uh, in, uh, at the time. So it could be interpreted either way. Um, and the plum bob certainly suggests that we're looking at some form of building or landscape management for the, for the, the deposition of this horde. Um, and you'll note, I carefully skirt over what the, the key might mean, because I don't know. Um, so I'll figure that one out for another time. Um, if we zoom out and try and think about the context of where it was buried, why was this group of objects um, buried uh, just outside Ampleforth? Um, I can't tell you a lot about the precise context of it. Um, one, because I can't tell you which field it's from, but also because the field actually isn't massively helpful for us. It's a very rocky field, and it's just on the beginnings of a slope, um, of quite a steep slope. Certainly not the sort of place that I'm expecting we're going to find a big Roman villa or something that's being sought for blessing. What's interesting is there are lots of springs that run down that field. And springs are interesting for us in the Roman period because they are often places that people um, hid objects nearby. You put, put things into water as an offering to the gods as well. And that's sort of an interesting thing. We've conducted geophysics on the fields, which turned up nothing, sadly. Um, and hoping to do some excavation at some point, but haven't done that yet. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, this is a, a map from the Roman Rural Settlement Project. Don't worry about all the, the dots and the like mean. Um, they are where evidence for excavated rural, Roman rural settlement has been found in this part of the world. And the, this is where the board is from, um, up here uh, near Amplesworth. I put this on here really because the map of what we know about excavated Roman rural settlement suggests there isn't much in the vicinity of the Rydale board. Um, and I suppose when I was told where it was from, I was a little bit surprised. This isn't the sort of bit of Yorkshire that I would necessarily expect this group of objects from, but always good to be challenged in my assumptions. When we started to do a little bit more research, um, this is a, a map. So for orientation, this is Amberford here, and this is Helmsley up here. Um, and the hoarders is from this area in the middle here. And I'm not gonna be any more precise than that. Um, and just the little blobs that are on here are where we have known settlements or Roman field system or Roman roads in the vicinity. And there's a bit more detail on here as held in um, 
the published digital sources. I think if you went and did the work in the HER, you'd probably find even more. We haven't got as far as that just yet. Um, but what we can say is that in a kind of ring around where we know the horde is from, we have reasonably good evidence for Roman settlement. And I think if you went and excavated in that central area and looked really hard, you would find it as well. I guess the, the kind of take, crucial takeaway is that this is an area that is fundamentally transformed in the Roman period. There are new roads, new farms, new field systems that emerge in this period of time. And we can see that in the kind of in some of this archaeology. Um, and I'm just going to briefly talk about three sites, the ones with uh, red rings around them. Um, this one, there should be a little blue dot here. Imagine there is. It dropped off my map earlier for some reason. And these are three villas. So three uh, Roman villas that we know from this area, um, from Beedlam, Alston, and Hovingham. Um, Beedlam, one of those three blobs, is a very high status uh, set of buildings. Um, you can see it here under excavation. Um, two large stone buildings um, and sort of reconstruction from English heritage here. Um, they have mosaics in them. So you're looking at um, real disposable wealth, um, somewhat at the, the apex of Roman society at this moment in time. Multiple phases, lots of rebuilding, um, a real, really wealthy place. Even grander still is Alston Roman Villa, where you have this seven meter long uh, Roman mosaic, um, uh, used to be on display in Hospitium uh, in, in uh, museum gardens. Um, it's vast, one of the largest mosaics um, uh, from Roman Yorkshire, um, and is a really, very, very well made thing. Um, you can see the sort of um, curving building here um, and uh, quite nicely um, executed at the top here. And really, this is a grand scale of things. Um, someone right, again, right at the top of um, uh, the kind of the pyramid of society. And then slightly, uh, slightly patchier evidence from Hovingham, um, but you have a very big building, um, hypercoursed, um, fragmentary mosaic, and coin finds, again, uh, this is um, quite antiquarian evidence here, but again, similar sort of thing. And I just show you these three sites, not because the only settlement in the Roman period is Roman villas, um, but these are kind of, these are the sites that are the most visible to us archeologically. And the creation of Roman villas um, comes with it. You needed supporting systems around that. You need farms, you need a kind of a wealthy estate that surrounds your, your villas. And it strongly suggests that um, this, is, this is a landscape that is being transformed. You don't get giant square buildings with mosaics in them before the Roman period. Um, this is high status, valuable land, um, extensive land, wealthy people living here. And I just really would say that this is a landscape that is transformed during the Roman period. And with that um, comes um, farms um, being created, roads laid out, and really the exploitation of the countryside in a way that hadn't occurred before. Skip that one. Um, and this is just all of the Port of Antiquities scheme data. So this is all of the metal detected finds, Roman Roman objects found within ten miles of um, uh, of the hoard site. There's lots of them. Is the kind of crucial thing from this. So each of those is evidence for some form of Roman activity. And these, if the, if our villas are right at the top of society, these objects that are on on this map here, all of the various dots are probably the, the material culture of the people a little bit further down um, society, I suppose. And it just suggests to me that we're looking at an, a, a landscape that is thoroughly exploited and very efficiently settled in the Roman period, um, which shouldn't surprise us. It's just there wasn't a lot of, isn't a lot of evidence directly for that. And the only object I will hand, point to you is this one. Um, so these are this is a horse and rider brooch, and it's one of the closest finds to the center of my circle, which is where the board is from. Um, and it's really interesting that we've got a statue of Mars and a brooch of horse and rider using the same imagery that were found only a few miles apart when they are otherwise incredibly rare across Northern Britain. And you can just begin to sort of tease out some connections um, between the Rydell Horde site and the areas around it. Um, there's clearly a lot more work that can be done here. Or we're just at the beginnings of these explorations. And I'll just show you this, which is a, not a terribly straightforward graph but these different lines represent different types of farm. So open farms, closed farms, or complex farms in the language of the time, of the language of the, the Roman rural settlement project. What they suggest is that there's different ways of doing farming. 
and that in the Iron Age, which you see on the left here, the enclosed farming predominates. But by 250, complex farms, um, which are with much more enclosed or kind of different ways of keeping animals and uh, growing crops, have taken over. And that is just a, a farming landscape which is shifted markedly. And those, those villas, the types of farms that we have, all suggest really that, that point that I'm trying to make is that there is a transformation of the rural environment. And I would say that we should be seeing the deposition of the Rydell Horde as one, as a kind of material marker of that process. I don't know when in this process it was, you know, is it a, is it a farm, is it a road, is it a field system? But it's probably linked to those fundamental changes in the rural economy. Um, and it kind of provides a really neat moment in time um, for it. It's probably someone seeking the blessing of the emperor um, uh, for making some of the changes that you see outlined on the screen here. Um, process, I suppose. Um, for about three minutes, I'm just going to give you a very quick sense of the exhibition. Um, um, when we were putting this exhibition together, I knew less about this horde than I knew now. Um, it was brand new, and um, we had about three or four months to pull it together. And we wanted to acknowledge the fact that we don't have all of the answers. And actually that one of the most powerful things we can do as a museum is to admit that, to give people reasons why we don't know that, the evidence, and then almost ask them to make their own minds up, have their own argument, have a discussion. Um, I'm delighted when people wander out of my exhibition arguing with one another, which is uh, uh, nothing I we often say. Um, and we pose the question at the very beginning of the exhibition of who buried the board and why that question that I've been trying to answer this evening. Um, and we present a few different options within that and try and give people some evidence um, for some different possibilities, I suppose. Um, so we display the hoard, but we also show some of the, use it as a way to show some of the other objects. So I've talked about the cult of the imperial um, priests today. We've got lots of other objects that speak about that in our collection. So this is a, a coin that says uh, Divas on it. So a deified emperor here visible on coins from other parts of the collection. And um, we have uh, altars and the like that might have been used alongside that, um, that figure of Mars. And really we try to give a sense of, uh, use the hoard as a snapshot, but a way of exploring our collections in a new way. Um, the hoard itself, we tried to let it breathe a little bit. We gave it its own little space within the exhibition and it's sort of, uh, it's the last thing you see, I sort of tease people and um, come all the way through and then there it is to be revealed at the end. Um, we displayed it in the round so that you can see, get all the way around it. And it's some of those objects are kind of best understood actually by looking at them from behind. And in asking people, um, we pose, in posing the question, we also give people a chance to answer that question. So who do you think buried the board and why? Leave us a note on post-it notes. Um, so there's some really nice ones on here lost by a farmer from Naya, age nine. Um, a lot of people think it's Russell Crowe. So it's the only thing I'd tell you this evening. It's not Russell Crowe. No matter how many people write on a post-it notion in the museum, um, it's not Russell Crowe. Um, and then we've done some uh, smart uh, 3D scanning um, as part of the exhibition, working with the University of York. So we've got created 3D models of all of the objects, which you can, if you fancy, you can scan a QR code and investigate those. Um, and we have got some 3D prints, which I was hoping to bring with me this evening, but I didn't get back to the museum in time before it closed. But you can, um, they're printed in plastic, so you can get a real sense of the size, um, but not the weight of them. Um, but you, it gives you a chance to be slightly more tactile with those objects than you could ever be with the real thing. Um, and then the last uh, thing is, we also invited some kind of creative responses to um, to the exhibition. So we worked with York and John animation students and set them the brief of explain the ideas behind the Rydell Horde in a minute to 11-year-olds. Um, and so they have they created a series of animations and you'll see one behind you at the moment, which play on a loop in the exhibition. And they're, I guess, a bit of fun um, and a kind of light-hearted way of approaching what is sometimes a complicated subject. <laughs> they come, um, I guess we weren't so worried about the precise accuracy so much as about conveying the kind of sense of, of some of this. Um, and we were delighted actually.
And um, we have run a program of talks as part of the exhibition. So um, uh, details of all of them are on the website. We've got two more left, one in February, one later this month, and one in March, but they're all going all the way back to uh, April of last year. They're all available to watch on our YouTube channel. So we've got a mix of, I guess, external speakers kind of giving wider perspectives on the Rider Horde and internal staff doing kind of more detailed approaches to some of the objects within the exhibition. And so if you should so desire, you can find out more about the Horde um, uh, on our website. So then what happens next, and I will uh, be quiet in a moment, is, is um, detailed study is what happens next. Um, we started the process, but we haven't gone and got all of the comparators that we could, and we certainly haven't looked outside Britain. So going and widening that out across the rest of the empire is a really important part of the process. We've done a very little bit of landscape analysis, haven't done any excavation, and that'll be a real thing we should be doing in the not too distant future, I hope. Um, and then doing filling in some of those gaps in my maps will be enormously helpful as well. And I think there's a there's a point to do some um, real material science work here, understanding the alloys of these objects, um, investigating the inside of that bust. So we haven't cleaned anything on the interior with the idea that um, we might hopefully do a bit of work on that at some point in the future. And hopefully in kind of pulling on some of those threads, we'll ultimately end up with a new understanding for why hell works. And you know, who knows, in three years time, I'm completely wrong. Um, but that's kind of exciting for me as a curator. Um, I hope this evening I've kind of given you an insight into what I think is one of the most exciting discoveries of recent years and a sense of its importance and its context. It is an amazing, if somewhat enigmatic group of objects. I think it was probably accumulated by someone connected to kind of Roman official power. I don't think you'd have a, a, a bust of the emperor without that. And probably buried as an offering to the gods um, to bless an act of landscape um, or building management, I suppose. But that story will continue to evolve and we should know more in the months and years to come. So the last thing I will say is um, if you wish to see it, it is on display until spring of next year. Um, you'll be very welcome. Um, and um, it's the first thing you see when you walk into the museum, so you shouldn't miss it. Um, and if you figure all of the answers out, put them on a post-it note and I'll put them in my next book. Thank you very much. Oh yes, they're still here. Um, any questions? Run to me. One is sort of key hand as something of an amateur metallurgist. That's not been handled very much before it was buried. Is think something like a key? I mean, my already my door keys are showing signs of wear and they're copper alloy. You would think any copper alloy, like a coin, that's been handled a great deal and used a great deal should have more wear than that. So that would imply that it was it's broken before its time was up. I, I think that's probably right. I don't think it's I don't think any of our objects have lived a very long life and then been buried. I think they, I wouldn't, you don't know right, how long, yeah. but um, but I think you're, you're right. I, I would be quite interested to try and pin down the date of our key a bit more precisely, mm. um, if we can, um, to, to know that a little bit more. But mm. you're right, none of them really show any signs of use work, particularly. Yeah. The only thing that might have a kind of slightly longer biography is uh, is the bust which has got these holes in the front of it, yeah. um, which you can't necessarily see terribly well from my picture, but two of them are quite crude and square, and one of them is quite neatly drilled and circular. Um, and it might be that they've been made at different times. Um, so yeah, so that it's either been remounted or yeah. what, or, or the mounting has failed and they've needed to add something else. And so yeah. it's the, but it, just, I wouldn't describe it as worn, no. but it, it, it's the only one that you can really kind of buy. What sort of thickness are we talking about near the site of the vault? I mean, you're, it's only a few millimeters, so it's not, right. it's not a big, it's not a, uh, where some of the other examples are big, thick, heavy objects. This yeah. isn't one particularly. Just um, it's cracked on, no. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it may have been wrenched off yes. a scepter. Yes. That could be why some of the damage is, and is a, as a kind of ritual before it goes into the ground. Um, but we, we, we don't know that. Right. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you would find this kind of 
So no excavation was conducted at the time. Um, no, um, hasn't. Nothing has happened since yet either. Um, I'm reasonably comfortable. So we've got quite a good relationship with the landowner. Um, so I, I think we will be able to do so. But no, no block lift. Um, it came out of the ground. All came out of the ground before we heard about it. I suppose so. Um, uh, I, although being in 2020. Uh, whether even if we had known about it, we, I, I, we might have been able to do something, but I, I, I couldn't have promised that either, I suppose. So. Yes, we've got, we've got, we have all of the, all of the digital things they have. Um, so only photographs, no video. Um, uh, and they are, I guess, more understandably more focused on the objects than the immediate context. So. Um, most of the images we have the, of the whole, the excavation I would maybe describe it as, um, are in the, is in the background of the other thing. So uh, I, I think short, the only way you'll be able to do it is go back and open up the area immediately around it. And I'm not convinced we're going to get a lot out of that, but for the sake of completeness, we, we may as well do so. The, um, the geophysics was described as... Um, one of the least interesting surveys that has ever been conducted. <laughs> so, um, um, I'm, yeah, so I'm not, I, I'm not expecting to find buildings or anything like that. Actually, if you look at the landscape, the field itself is really rocky with rocky outcrops, not flat. So any scale of building would be very small. So you're probably looking at something else, but what the something else is, I, I don't know yet. Um, I was we, do, we don't yet so i would um we got them we put them on display pretty much i think whenever they come off display um so what will happen we, we have this exhibition through until spring of next year i think there'll be a period after that where you would um do all of the i guess the material science work on them um i think of that type um try and characterize the metals um look inside bust um, with an idea that they will go back on display into our Roman galleries at some point thereafter, but a few months away, a bit of analysis will then allow us to tell a different story with them going forward. And so that's kind of, that, that's in my mind where we will do it. At the moment, I would love to do it, but if I take the star of the show out of our main exhibition, then um, particularly when I come and told you all, you have to come and see it, um, I might get disgruntled visitors. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you say a bit more? You can't reveal the, the whole content. Can you say a little more about the site itself? Because I find like there's lots to be found in a special place. So where a stream merges or where the particular vista or um, the foundation of something. So have you got any sense of what was special about that particular um, site for the, the area? Um I, I, to your second question, no, I can tell you a little bit more about the site, um, but I can't tell you exactly why I think it was there. Um, so it is um, at the at the bottom of what becomes quite a steep slope, um, uh, uh, going up into uh, up into well, it's, you're at the beginning of the moors, basically. So up into that, and um, running down that slope including on the edges of the field, but not within the field, are a series of springs. So not just one, I think there's four in the kind of not too far away. Um, it is very rocky. So there's, it had this field now, it has, I think it has sheep in it now, but I, I don't, I don't, you wouldn't get a plow through it um, because um, there's only quite a shallow, well, in certain areas of it are very shallow or with rocks emerging out from it. I mean, there are there is a modern routeways nearby to it, modern roads, um, which one could imagine might ultimately be not too far away from routeways through that landscape in the Roman period. Can't be certain about that, but it's a reasonable assumption. So, um, yeah, when I when I'm thinking about it, um, you talked about views or vistas. I think you may be closer to. I'd be thinking more along those lines. So this is a. a it's not a high point, but it's beginning to get like one and looking out, as opposed to I put a building on this place or or or, or something like that. Um, so it may be there because of the connections to the water, or it may be there because it's got a view slightly over the landscape. 
I mean, if it was more about the landscape setting and the viewpoint, I might expect it to be further up the slope. Um, but then you don't know what's wooded and what isn't either. So there's a there's a there's challenges around that. Um, we can do a kind of view shed analysis. So in in software, you can see how far you can see from that site and be seen if you don't have wood, uh, tree cover. Um, which I haven't done, but actually it's quite an interesting idea. So maybe I, I next time I do it. How do you follow up that that piece of work if you like? How are you following up more of the kind of nature of the place. Um, it, 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 it sounds a little flippant, um, ask the right people. So we're, um, we're, a, we're a relatively small team in the museum and um, we can do some of this analysis, but we are not landscape archeologists, nor are we material scientists. And so our approach is really to try and identify the right people to work with and bring them together and put together a research project basically and get the experts in, so we, what we really need is an art historian and a material scientist and a landscape archaeologist. Um, get them to all talk to one another and we'll figure it out from there because there's only, with the best will in the world, there's only so far we can go and, you know, we can't be specialists in everything. And so um, acknowledging that, embracing it and then getting, talking to the right people. And frankly, there's lots of the right people in York to, to do that. So, I, yeah. yeah. How many have any... Italian archaeologists taking us in. The reason I asked is that I visited a very wealthy Canadian friend in the show that was called. But not Marcus Aurelius. And she was so adamant that you would not. But she has spent a lot of time in Greece and Rome studying archaeology. And she was just convinced that it's not even a Roman face. And she did so mm -hmm. sure of that. Uh, uh, no, was, I haven't had a we haven't had any Italians look at it. Um, if I go back to what I said about it being a provincial style, then I think uh, if you showed this to someone in Rome in the second century, they would also agree and go, that's not Marcus Aurelius, because it doesn't look like him. It doesn't look like those, those beautiful uh, statuary that we can see. It doesn't look like the coins. This is a local adaptation of that. It is a creation of it in the style of, um, of Britannia, basically. So it is... And you can see elements of the Iron Age traditions in, in art represented here. And so it is very much a, a local reinterpretation of the emperor, probably made in Britain for a British audience and using iconography and imagery that will make sense to them. Um, if you take this to, so I, it, I, I might be wrong. And your, your colleague, if they, if they have studied um, art history in Rome, they, they probably know more than I, but um, we have, the people who know about art history in Britain are pretty comfortable that this is a Roman emperor and that Marcus Aurelius is the best, um, and the best estimate of which emperor it is, I suppose. It doesn't say Marcus on it or anything along those lines, it's not quite as simple as that, but um, uh, that's, that is the thinking behind it at the moment. Um, so I could be wrong, and um, I, if someone can show me what else it is, then I'm very happy to to, to take that. But um, that would be, um, in a way, I wouldn't be surprised if it if it wasn't recognisable on the basis of what you get in, I guess, the southern parts of the empire. Um, I think if you showed a, by the same token, if you show a Roman archaeologist who's worked in Italy, what we call a Roman villa in Britain, they would laugh at because a Roman villa in, in Italy is vast, it's wealthy, it's huge. And I can talk about really high status villas with mosaics and the like in it. And you know, no, that's, that's nothing compared to what we get in Northern Italy. So it's, um, it's, it's probably a little bit about context and what the expectations are, I would suggest. Um, um, this is absolutely amazing and a wonderful and beautiful for Britain. But we have to remember, as much as I think our Roman archeology span is amazing, it is, if you've ever been to Rome, it is not quite as good. I can okay. go anywhere. I was actually studied at Rome. I could say yes, because yeah. uh, in the Capitoline Museum, they said that, well, you see the statue of Marcus Aurelius mounted outside in the piazza was thought to have been Constantine for many <laughs> centuries. They swore it was Constantine. And somebody said, oh, no, he's on horseback. So that must be Marcus Aurelius. So yeah, these things aren't set in stone, are they? We take these interpretations and yeah, the further we get from the heart of Rome, the wider the interpretation. Graham, sorry. Uh, yeah, one of the questions. Yeah, Zoom. 
first one is, is it possible to write a line of the year and to tell whether it would be likely to occur? If it's likely to occur, then I have a chance. Uh, so the question is, can we analyze the soil to determine whether the iron would uh, corrode away? Um, and I say the question to you all as a way of padding while I think yeah. the answer. Um, um, I, I, it's a short answer, I don't know the question. I, I, um, I would have to defer to someone who knows a little bit more about that. Um, I would be surprised if the soil analysis would tell you, because it's really you're looking at how wet, dry things are. Um, uh, and what you would really want to know that would help you figure out whether your iron was there or not would be is if you could open the area up under controlled circumstances, whether you would see staining in the soil that would suggest that the iron was was present or not at the time. Obviously, if, if, if they've been removed from their context and that's been jumbled up, you would have lost that. But if they were in part of a larger container or something that had iron in it and um, that was outside of that immediately kind of quite narrowly dug hole, and you might catch that in an excavation, um, but you don't know until you investigate. But there's no reason it has to be an iron object either. It could be a, um, could have just been put in a hole in the ground. So if you can imagine this is a set of objects that are not designed to be recovered, this is an offering to the so you're permanently putting them out of that. Could have just been put in a hole in the ground. Could have been put in organic in the ground, so textile or wood that again, would probably only survive if we're lucky or in staining in the, in the ground. So I think going, opening an area immediately around that kind of narrow hole might help us answer some of those questions, but I fear that all of that immediate archaeological context may have already been lost at this point. Any more from Zubgren? Yes, the second question was, um, can you say a bit more about the context in Um, it, it is not uh, so is it a scepter head so the question a couple of questions so one is is it a scepter head and is that identification and how a scepter is used um is it definitely a scepter head no it isn't absolutely certainly a scepter head um that's the current theory behind it. The only thing that gives pause for thought about that is that, and you get much more sense of it if you come and see it. So another plug for the museum. Um, but if you look at it from the front, it looks really very good. But then actually seen in the round, mm -hmm. as you get round to the back of the head, it's quite simple, quite stylized, and particularly with that kind of slightly grotty plate added to the back. Actually, maybe not so quite so. Fantastic. And, and whether then it would be a scepter that you could see in the round or whether it is uh, some of the other suggestions could be mounted onto to something else where you can only see it from one side, that is a possibility. Um, what might help us answer that question is um, doing a kind of, I guess, more detailed study of those other objects that have been identified as scepter heads um, and comparing their form um, how they are mounted, the holes or rivets and the like, um, and, their, and their construction techniques, as well as if we can find some from the near continent as well, doing the same. And that may give us a greater sense of their use, I suppose. Um, how were they used? Um, you're in really difficult territory there because um, we don't really know. Um, uh, there are occasional passing historical references to this type of thing. Um, but none of them are second century Britain. You're looking at something on the other side of the empire. And if we've already talked about the difference between what depictions of the emperor looked like in Rome and in Northern Britannia, there's no necessary, necessarily uh, the idea that they would those ceremonies and their use would be the same. So I, I, I think we, we, we can't say for certain other than we can kind of talk about it in the generalities of how, um, how we think religious objects were used. And, um, no, no, I can't say a lot more about how scepter heads were used, to be honest. Um, or indeed, that this is definitely a scepter head. Um, uh, so, yeah, I'm happy. I guess what I should say is, what we're talking about our exhibition, happy to admit where we don't know. And that is the question we don't know. Um, 
this, does this help us get closer to the answer to those, some of those questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it requires a kind of level of study that we haven't done just yet. So um, good question. Right. We'll, we'll see, we'll put it into the next exhibit. Well, then, plus. Yeah. Just um, it, it doesn't have to be an emperor. Um, it is just a bearded male. So we can say that for certain. It is uh, attributed as an emperor uh, on the basis of comparison to others that we are slightly more confident about being an emperor. So particularly the, the steam head, as, uh, which is the, the really beautiful one with the blue eyes that I've showed halfway through, is the closest sort of art historical parallels. And it, it is, if it isn't Marcus Aurelius, it is a very good likeness of him. Um, the style of the beard, the style of the hair, um, and like it, everything about it um, speaks of that emperor. And so the, the, the attribution of this to, him as an emperor and to Marcus in particular is almost by, well, if we can be confident that one is, then we can be reasonably confident this one is. There are a set of assumptions in that, which I absolutely will be happy to um, accept, um, but that is, that's the thinking behind it. And yeah. I guess the other side of it is that we know that there is a, a cult of the imperial, uh, of the emperor. We have references to priests of, the, um, um, of, of that cult. And um, we find um, objects like this um, in association with objects, that, with things that we know are scepters. And so there's a sort of, there is some assumptions that are jumped along the way in all of that. But th that's the kind of the best working theory that we have. Why? Uh, <laughs> it, it's... The, the style, we can't say that for certain, but the style of this, if this is not someone trying to depict Marcus Aurelius, I'd be enormously surprised. The style of that beard is absolutely typical of, of his portraiture. So, uh, um, it, yeah, so it, 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 if it sounds bonkers, um, it, 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 um, that is uh, how a lot of these attributions work, you know, and we have lots of visual culture of the time, particularly coins of which were struck in their millions and are the kind of mass medium of the Roman period, which allow us to be pretty confident about how emperors wanted to depict themselves in their life and then how they are, their successors wanted to depict them after their deaths. And so they are, the, the, I guess, the mass medium of the time. And it means that when we find depictions of people, we have got a whole range of, um, of objects that we can be absolutely certain who they are, that we can compare them against. And so um, if it isn't Marcus Aurelius, it is someone who has absolutely immersed themselves in the visual culture of, of Marcus Aurelius and trying to, to do that. Um, and I, it's, a, it's a bit of a, I can't think who else would have, would be capable of doing that, I suppose. So it is, can I say for certain? No, probably not. But I, I'm, I'm reasonably convinced myself, I suppose. And I hope some of you are as well. Just one last thing, Keith, finally, but I'll take your... Um, um, so it, it depends on who and why. So after, after their death, um, you get into the realms of you know, political history. So is it expedient to deify the previous emperor or is it expedient to go a couple back from there? It maybe depends on how you took control of the empire. So if you were nominated by previous emperor and you are my, the anointed, you're going to be next, then it is within, it's very much, uh, I guess, advantageous for your political position to deify that previous emperor. Um, because that solidifies your own power, I suppose. And so um, in the second century, you have a kind of relatively successful, uh, um, success, uh, peaceful succession. You know, um, that, that system breaks down somewhat in later periods um, where one passes on to the next and often deifies the previous because that sort of solidifies that um, uh, passing on of power. Um, so it's very much, um, yeah, it's, it's political expediency um, and your relationship with your predecessor will determine um, uh, whether 
how what, they're usually even if they are deified, how widely that cult then spreads, perhaps. Um it can work the other way around. You can have um damnatio memoriae, whether mm -hmm. you wipe all me all mention of them from the record, you know, scratch their names out of stonework and the like. Um, yeah, Caracalla's um, brother. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The, the Severins in York, um Caracalla, the must not so nice brother, wipes yeah. his brother's image from off everything. Um, yeah. off everything. And the very famous image of his father, father, son, older brother, and then a big hole here yeah. where Geeson's face should the be. Other one. Yeah. yeah. And finally, Keith. Uh, for the mundane question, uh, I don't think you mentioned it, but how much did it go for at the auction? Uh, I didn't mention it. Uh, it went, <laughs> I, I think it's a matter of public record. I, I don't know the precise number of it. It was about 170,000 pounds. Oh, right. Ooh. That's after the detection. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's a it's a very large sum of money. Um um very large sum of money for a museum to raise. Um, and actually the scale of it is in some ways a bit of a challenge for the finders and the landowner. Obviously, spending the money is not that much of a challenge, but um if one of them had wanted to donate it to a museum, um they couldn't almost because you need the agreement of all three. Um uh, uh and um it's almost why having the kind of protections of treasure and the, the kind of the sets of procedures that come with that are really important for museums. Um, otherwise you have you have to have discussions and get an agreement on price between three different people. And, and it's why usually where there are these high value things, they end up in auction because it's it's almost too complicated to do anything but that. And that's a I, I guess a failure of our our, our, our systems really, um, which is a bit of a pity, but um one that we can't really change within our current legislative environment. Right. It's, I think you've done more than enough, Andrew. Uh, we haven't exhausted the subject, but I don't want to exhaust you. So can I just thank you? Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you in four weeks from now when Ian Milstead will give a talk on the archaeology and prescription. That's our next talk four weeks from now. I hope everybody, all our members have paid their subs to need to want to be to remind you. So thank you very much. Have a safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.